Millennium Vinyl Society. This convertible just reached out and grabbed me. <laughs> she's mine, she's mine. How much did you festival? Well, I've been coming for, I guess, at least a dozen years, and I occasionally buy a car. We came because we've been here since Thursday to look at cars and buy cars. So there's there's some, some very, very good deals and some that's not so good, but this year there seem to be uh, some pretty good prices. Festival organizers predict that 300,000 people will attend this year's event. It was the Celebrity Car Auction Day at the Auburn Court Duesenberg Festival. The famous Chitty Chitty Bang Bang cars sold for $160,000. A bargain hunter paid $19,000 for Tammy Faye Baker's 85 Christmas present from Jimmy at Cadillac Seville. The racing car that Tom Cruise drove in the days of thunder went for $31,000. I think it'll make some of the money back, but still it's an, uh, a celebrity investment. So it's, uh, it's not... It's not 100% just for advertising and making the money back, but it, the car will still have value when it's done. Well, and looky here, the buy of the day, folks. This pink Charlie Angels man, complete with guns and handcuffs, that cost only $11,000. For many people, Labor Day signals the end of summer, but such is not the case weather-wise. Chris says hot and humid conditions should stick around for the coming week and a little later. Is there such a thing as a bad breed of dog? Stay with us. Tomorrow's forecast in only two minutes. birthday that I remember that Joyce handed her a package and she just literally ripped into it, you know, and you could see this elation building on her face. And she looked and it was a dress and she turned to Joyce and looked just like that. And I mean, you can see it so plain. This couldn't, couldn't you do better than that? That was just the way she was. I mean, just a little bit on the ornery side, but that was what made her so endearing. And yet it's that spirit is what I think everybody admires in Nancy. She wasn't afraid of anything. Not of anything at all. And if there were any person in the world that I needed, it was Nancy. And to have something happen to her was so frightening and, and just so I wasn't able to comprehend. The nightmare began on January 11th, 1983. It was a cold night. Ice covered this deserted country road when Nancy Cruzan lost control of her car. As the car flipped over, Nancy was thrown face down into a ditch. Her heart stopped beating for almost 20 minutes. A state trooper found Nancy and pronounced her dead. But a few minutes later, an ambulance crew arrived and brought her back to life. And when they brought her in, from the ambulance, I remember so clearly. I didn't think it was her. You couldn't really see her face. Her, her hair was brushed back, probably from blood. And I, I thought, you know, that's not Nancy. And then the thing that, that I knew it was, was I saw her socks. She looked so small on that stretcher. And of course, she was bloody and they had a mask on her and, and, uh, uh, but she looked so small. It became more and more apparent that she had very, very severe brain damage. I, I know that, that I did, and I'm sure Joyce did too, that I would put my forehead on Nancy's forehead and I would just will some of the strength of my brain into hers to where, to where she could come back. The family wants so badly for the patient to wake up and, and goes to the bedside to see signs of consciousness, to see signs of interaction, and they don't see anything. Dr. Ronald Cranford, a highly regarded neurologist, first examined Nancy Cruzan in 1987 at the family's request. In Nancy's case, the upper half of her brain has been destroyed from lack of oxygen at the time of the accident. This part controls thinking, feeling, seeing, hearing. It controls everything related to what makes us uniquely human. So this part has been destroyed. Nancy's completely unconscious. She will never regain consciousness. She will never experience pain or suffering. But 
because the lower brain, the brain stem, is intact. She had periods of eyes opening. She has sleep-wake cycles. She can breathe on her own spontaneously, and she can live in this condition for years or decades. Because she can't eat normally, an artificial feeding tube has been inserted into her stomach, and so several times a day she's fed artificial nutrition and hydration. When you walk in and when you see Nancy, the eyes are open. She looks like she's perfectly conscious, so she's aware of what's going on. Uh, but then after you examine her and after the parents have been with her for six years, you recognize that the eye movements are random, that she's really not aware of anything going on in the room. She's not looking at you and recognizing you. She's not looking at her father, mother, and recognizing them. She's not there. When we finally came to the conclusion that, that things were not going to change, and yet Nancy would hate to be in the situation that she's in, to just simply exist. We, we knew that we must do something to help her. And what that was is, is to request the hydration and nutrition be withdrawn, to let the death that occurred January 11th be official, be recognized. It's something we feel like we have to carry out for her. Something that, that Nancy would ask, you know, this is the last thing that I'll ask of you. And I need your help. When you finally decided what you were going to do, did you have any ambivalence about it? The thoughts were more, I wish we didn't have to do this. For almost seven years, Nancy Cruzan has been suspended between life and death in the state hospital in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Two years ago, Joe and Joyce Cruzan asked the hospital to stop the nutrition and fluids that keep their daughter alive. When the hospital said no, the Cruzans went to court to argue Nancy's right to die. The first judge found the evidence compelling that Nancy would not want to live in this condition and granted permission to the Cruzans. But the state of Missouri appealed. Three months later, the Missouri Supreme Court ruled four to three against the family that Nancy's feeding tube could not be removed. The question is, can somebody choose to end Nancy's life other than Nancy? Judge Edward Robertson of the Missouri Supreme Court wrote the majority opinion that ruled against the Cruzan family. For the first time, he agreed to talk publicly about his views on this case. This is not Big Brother staring down over the bed of Nancy Cruzan and saying, you must live. This may be the law saying, we don't know what you want. Maybe you want to live, and if we're going to make a mistake, that's the side we're going to come down on. Families have always made these decisions in our society. Families care about and nurture and love one another. They're the ones who have to make difficult decisions. The state has no place in that decision making. It never has and it shouldn't have. Its, its role should be to make certain that the family is properly motivated. And there's absolutely no dispute and not one piece of evidence in this case that the Cruzans are not properly motivated. They, everyone acknowledges they love their daughter deeply. They're just trying to do what they know she would want and what legally she is entitled to. Now, Nancy's parents make the argument, and it's one that I think is, is uh, believable, that they know her well enough to be able to make some assumptions. But we generally don't permit such drastic remedies in the law as cutting off food and water based on some assumptions. How do you know that Nancy, being so strong-willed as you know she is, isn't saying right now, I want to live? The fact that she was a strong-willed person would indicate to me, says to me, that I don't want this kind of thing. I don't want this uh, degrading existence to where I have absolutely no control over anything of my body. Uh, I don't want this humiliation. So maybe this strong will of hers might be saying, let me go. And Missouri says no. Nancy gets lost along the way. 
We all kind of do. It's almost like it's simply a legal question, but it's not a legal question. It's a personal question. It's about somebody that we love so much and so difficult to make. Um, and yet, you just have to wait. <laughs> wait and see what happens. The Cruzan family's dilemma is not unique. There are at least 10,000 Americans in the persistent vegetative state with no hope of regaining consciousness. Just a few doors down from Nancy Cruzan's hospital bed lies 19-year-old Chris Busalaki, who's been in a vegetative coma for almost three years. Chris's automobile accident was May 29th, 1987. I find it very difficult to go and see her because you just don't want to believe that she's going to stay like that forever. When you go to sit by her, you're not thinking about the day that you found her from the accident. You're thinking about...